that you're supposed to start taking it right away. I wonder if they're good for other anyway. viruses as well if, you know, that aren't so targeted. I wonder. I don't, know. I don't know. The Tamiflu is pretty much for that, you know, the flu. So, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are, folks. It's seven after seven. Um, yeah. Let's do a little of second Isaiah. I'm not going to do Jeremiah then. Um, and that's okay, because there was probably plenty to do with this. But um, I, I think it'd be fun to just go through uh, some of uh, what this is about. Um, and I, I think, do you, let, me, let me check, um, you know, we say, are, you're, are you f familiar with the term second Isaiah? No, no. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it certainly our Bibles don't say that verse uh, that that chapters forty to sixty. Excuse me. That chapters forty to fifty-five of Isaiah are second Isaiah, and that chapters uh, fifty-six through sixty-six are third Isaiah. Uh, but scholars tell us that they're written by very different people at very different times, with very different agendas. Um. And the second Isaiah is chapter, again, 40 to 55 in the book of Isaiah. Uh, and this is a prophet who lived with the Hebrew exiles during the, the Babylonian captivity. And the thing that's notable, uh, and I think that might be of interest to Southminsterites, is that... Um, Second Isaiah is the most thoroughgoing monotheist in the Bible. Um, you might expect that, you know, the monotheism to be progressive, that we go from, you know, many gods and demigods and all kinds of crazy things, giants in the earth and Genesis, and that we somehow become more sophisticated over time um, till we get to pure monotheism. But Frankly, um, if we're to take the Lord's Prayer seriously, um, part of the Lord's Prayer says, uh, you know, protect us, uh, deliver us from the evil one. So there is a, there's a devil, uh, if, if Jesus believed that, um, and if that's truly from him and that line wasn't inserted, um, it's possible there are these demigods that um, Jesus had in mind, which um, this prophet who lived again during the time of the Babylonian exile um, didn't, um, would not at all uh, subscribe to. Um, and in fact, uh, he rejects the idea that the God named Yahweh uh, is a God who belonged to the Hebrew people. Um, which I find fairly interesting. Um, the God that Second Isaiah uh, talks about is uh, a God of the entire universe who created everything. Uh, and the idea is that God sits kind of in, uh, you know, transcendence, while everybody below is no more important than a grasshopper. And certainly the princes of the earth are, uh, are nothing or as nothing, according to this, uh, this prophet, which is rather fascinating and sophisticated and something that I think we'd all uh, like to subscribe to, uh, especially when we have low estimations of our own uh, world rulers. Um, any Comments on that? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand why I'd want to subscribe to something where humans are no more than grasshoppers. Right. That's a good point. Um, that's a really good point you're making. Um, and another question that pertains is why in the world is this prophet not named 
um, you know, Prophet Hezekiah or Prophet whatever his or her name was. Uh, why is it put under Isaiah? And I think one of the reasons has to do with the stance of the first Isaiah, who is credited with chapters 1 to 39. Uh, because in that, uh, and I, I'm trying to answer your question, Janet, uh, in, in chapter 6, in the famous, famous chapter 6 of that uh, uh, set of writings, um, that's where Isaiah has, um, you know, a vision of God in the temple. Uh, I was going to read that. I think I'll go ahead and read um, Frederick Beekner's version of it because it's kind of fascinating. This is um, this is the, the first the first Isaiah was a priest actually, who uh, probably had an expensive apartment. Uh, worked for the king, was paid probably from the royals, um, and, um, you know, probably served in the temple, uh, who has a religious experience that we would call mystical now. Uh, and this is uh, Beekner's uh, translation, or not translation, wouldn't even, <laughs> wouldn't call it a translation, but it's, it's Beekner's sense of it. There were banks of candles flickering in the distance and clouds of incense thickening the air with holiness and stinging his eyes and high above him as if it had always been there but was now only seen for what it was like a face in the leaves of a tree or a bear among the stars there was the mystery itself whose gown was the incense and the candles a dusting of gold at the hem there were winged winged creatures shouting back and forth the way excited children shot to each other when dusk calls them home. And the whole vast reeking place started to shake beneath his feet like a wagon going over cobbles. And he cried out, oh God, I'm, I'm done for. I am foul of mouth and a member of a foul mouth race. With my own two eyes, I have seen God. I'm a goner and sunk. Then one of the winged things touched his mouth with fire and said, there, it will be all right now. And the mystery itself said, who will it be? Who will it be? And with charred lips, he said, me. And mystery said, go. Mystery said, go give the deaf hell till you're blue in the face and go show the blind heaven till you drop in your tracks because they'd sooner eat brown glass than swallow the bitter pill that puts roses in the cheeks and a gleam in the eye. Go do it. And Isaiah said, do it till when? And mystery said, till hell freezes over. Mystery said, do it till the cows come home. And that is what a prophet does for a living. Starting from the year that King Uzziah died, when he saw and heard all these things, Isaiah went and did it. It's a mouthful. Um, I think it's a, you know, your question again was, why pay any attention to uh, a prophet who sees human beings as nothing more than grasshoppers? Uh, the first Isaiah uh, would answer, I think, well, it's not that we're just grasshoppers, except that we're grasshoppers in comparison with the holy. Um, so one shouldn't go too far and define us as worthless. Uh, we just say that... Um, Isaiah, particularly the first Isaiah, is again working in the temple and in the religion business, and so inured of religion that he can't see anything holy anymore. It's just all part of the religion game. And then he has a mystical experience that calls him back to, uh, or maybe even calls him for the first time to a to a, what would be called, a, you know, an experience of the mystical. And uh, it's all different. And he feels, uh, by comparison, uh, low as a snake's belly, uh, to use a metaphor. Uh, that may be... You might feel that way because you're down, you're disillusioned, you feel abandoned. Yeah. But I mean... People supposedly were created in God's image, and right. you know that's not exactly 
and and so yeah the, the psalmist the psalmist look at said it that way of course and says we're a little lower than the angels so that's that's a very different uh kind of uh idea um I have a question about Isaiah. It's just going to really show you how uninformed I am. But when I think of Isaiah, I think of um, the Messiah and the, you know, all of that prophecy yeah. about, about Christ. Is, right. which, which section is that in? That's uh, Isaiah chapter 40, which is the first chapter of second Isaiah. The okay. First chapter, yeah. I, and I wanted to at least get that far with the the three of us tonight. Um, it's interesting to see, I, I'm gonna, what I'd like to do is look at Isaiah chapter 39 and then look at Isaiah 40 and talk about the difference. So if you've got Isaiah 39 right there, it'd be good for us to look at those versions, okay? Okay. You want me to read? Yeah, let me just say, uh, set the, this is King Hezekiah of Judah, who has had an illness and has recovered and gets a letter of greeting from uh, the King of Babylon, which is kind of fascinating. It's the, uh, it'd be like, um, you know, the King of Brazil, if there was one getting uh a letter of thanks from, uh, well, what, where would it be? The, um, uh, the president of the United States, maybe, you know, in terms of um, one nation and another. So go ahead and read chapter 39 to us through uh, verse eight. Okay. At that time, oh dear, Merodach Baladan, son of Babylon, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of his illness and recovery. Hezekiah received the young boys gladly and showered them what was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, the fine oil, his entire armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, what did those men say and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied, they came to me from Babylon. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought, there will be peace and security in my lifetime. <laughs> That's a really interesting chapter. Um, Isaiah had been a priest in the temple of King Uzziah, and when he gives his little discussion in chapter six about his religious experience, his mystical experience of God, he, he, he prefaces it by saying, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Um, and it's interesting. Um, it's like once he realized, once the, the, the Uzziah had been king for 40 years, a very long time, and it was a very steady time, uh, so that um, he had a great reverence. And, and anybody who followed him would be considered small, it, a little like um, Franklin Roosevelt being followed by Harry Truman. Um, we, we look back and think Harry Truman was a man of great stature now, but he had to follow Roosevelt and most people felt it just wasn't, um, he, he just couldn't measure up. Um, it's good we had somebody as, as uh, amazing as Truman, I suppose, because um, 
he kept a lot of things together. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so poor Hezekiah has to follow uh, King Uzziah. And um, Hezekiah is doing the best he can uh, under the circumstances uh, at a time when the great power in the world is Babylon and it's just rising in its power. So the king gets sick and then he recovers and he gets this greeting from Marduk Baladan of uh, Babylon saying, you know, glad you're well and here's a gift and uh, blessings for your recovery. And Ezekiah invites him or Baladan uh, invites himself, whichever. Uh, and what does Hezekiah do but show him everything he's got? So he shows him not only his throne room and his royal scepter and all those things, but he shows him all his stores. Uh, and if you heard there, he not only showed him his silver, his gold, his spices, his olive oil, but his armory, his entire armory, meaning. <clears throat> This is what we have to protect ourselves from our enemies. Um, so that the word gets to <clears throat> Isaiah and probably lots of others. That uh, the king has shown his hand to our enemy number one. <clears throat> and um, now they know exactly what they could pillage from us in terms of silver and gold <coughs> if they defeat us in war and also what we have to defend ourselves which isn't very much <coughs> it kind of reminded me of um 1936 when uh winston churchill was totally shocked that um the mp the um Prime Minister at the time, PM, I guess, Stanley Baldwin invited uh, the Nazi high command to Britain and showed them uh, the Air Force um, and everything they had in the Air Force, which was uh, a complete shock to all those more hardliners in England who thought, oh my God, he's, <laughs> he's, uh, uh, almost gone over to the other side. Uh, and it, it's more than interesting that that last line, chapter or verse eight, um, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied to Isaiah for calling him on this, for he thought there will be peace and security in my time or my lifetime. It sounds an awful lot like Neville Chamberlain, who brokered a peace, you know, in 1938 over Czechoslovakia with Hitler. And yeah, said, I mean, how can you think this is a good deal? I don't exactly. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Well, it, it's the same thing that I think Baldwin and Neville Chamberlain were thinking. You know, we'll we'll be transparent and open, and uh, hopefully Hitler will be just as transparent and open, and we'll we'll, we'll make a deal man to man because everyone knows World War One was in, was terrible, and no one would want another war like that. <coughs> Isaiah okay. says to him, they're going to come take everything you have and make your sons eunuchs. And I mean, it, it, and he doesn't say, oh, no, you know, we're going to no. broker a peace deal. He just says, no. oh, that's good news. He, he, no, I don't think he says it's good news. I think he's saying, you know, you, you OK, it's good. It, this is the word of the Lord. It's it's acceptable because at least I won't live to see it. <laughs> Oh, okay. I think that's where he's coming well, from. There will be peace and security in my lifetime. Yeah. He's only he's only getting peace and security while he's there. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Right. So yeah. then um nothing that's the end of chapter 39 and then Isaiah 40 begins with uh, the familiar words from uh, from George Frederick Candle, right? Comfort, comfort my people, yeah. says your Lord, right? Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, proclaim to her that her hard sentence has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Um, 
we're talking about coming out of, of uh, exile at this point. So there's this amazing chasm between the end of 39 and the beginning of 40. And the chasm is 50 years of, of uh, exile <coughs> that the people have been in, um, which is another reason why people believe these are two separate uh, writers, two different prophets. Um, Isaiah was uh, prophesying the end of one um, kingdom and the exile of the people. Uh, and second Isaiah is saying, take heart, take heart. Um, God doesn't um, mean for, uh, Israel, for Judah to forever be in exile. So that's, that's a fair amount. And that's where a lot of this is coming from. Let me, let me answer, uh, since we're, it's just the three of us, let me answer uh, Janet's question about second Isaiah being, uh, you know, almost Christian in some ways, right? Because it's, it's been taken over by Handel's Messiah. And this is from um, a book that, um, probably the most <clears throat> respected Old Testament commentator of my lifetime, Walter Brueggemann, writes. He says, um, although it is clear that this poetry does not in any first instance have Jesus on its horizon, you know, we're talking about the Old Testament here, it is equally clear that the church from the outset has found this poetry a poignant and generative way to consider Jesus wherein humiliation <coughs> equals crucifixion and exaltation that Isaiah writes about equals resurrection and ascension. He says, in the evangelical catechism on which I was nurtured, the most extended presentation offers this theme or speaks to this theme. Question, in which passage of Holy Scripture do we find the humiliation and the exaltation of Christ briefly described? Answer, <clears throat> we find the humiliation and the exaltation of Christ briefly described in the passage in Philippians chapter 2, which is as follows. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, and therefore God has highly exalted him. The story of Jesus summarized in this lyrical passage is an account of how the humiliated Jesus in the Easter miracle is exalted to the right hand of God. The church is not able to say how this Saturday miracle works any more than we know how to move from Isaiah 52, 14 to Isaiah 52, 15 any more than the Isaiah tradition knew how to get from former things of punishment to latter things of deliverance. All that can be said in any of these cases is that a deep reversal of fortunes in the life of Israel and in the life of Jesus is evoked by the radical, powerful, inscrutable resolve of God to do something new. Uh, so he's talking about the, the gap between Isaiah 14 and 15. Let me read those verses. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, speaking of the suffering servant uh, passage that um, is so important in Handel's Messiah. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form <coughs> beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. So it, it kind of goes from humiliation to a certain kind of exaltation uh, with uh, no actual explanation at all. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that um, the way the New Testament interpreters uh, interpret uh, those first verses of Isaiah chapter 40. Um, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, it says, a voice cries out, 
quote, in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Um, what that's talking about is a way out of exile into a return to the promised land um, through desert regions. Matthew 3.3 3, uh, uses the same verse <clears throat> and changes the syntax is that certainly the word order um, in order to speak of, uh, of John the Baptist. Uh, there it says in Matthew 3, 3, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, this is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Um, it's interesting how that gets convoluted to suit the writer of Matthew. Uh, but it, I, and, you know, my high school English teacher would have fits over it because it's not a, at all what uh, Isaiah is talking about. But the New Testament writers were fine with playing fast and loose with any Old Testament text they wanted. One thing that um, Second Isaiah is really um, anxious about are idols. Um, and I think he's concerned, or she is concerned, because we don't know for sure who this is, with the temptation of the people uh, in Babylon to worship idols or worship the gods of Babylon that are um, that are pictured. Um, <clears throat> and um, the writer makes a lot of fun of idol worship. And again, uh, the writer is concerned with um, this radical kind of monotheism, one God only. In fact, uh, uh, the most thoroughgoing expression of monotheism is probably found in uh, God's statement about God's self uh, in verses six and seven of chapter uh, 45. So if you want to go to Isaiah 45, six and seven, that's kind of fascinating. Somebody want to read those verses? They kind of come in in the middle of a phrase, but that's okay. Okay, I'm trying to find it here. 45. Six and seven. Six and seven. Uh, that men may know. Is that where we, we want to be? 40. Sure. Could be. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. That men may know uh, from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make the wheel and create woe. I am the Lord who do, do, who do all these things. Great, what version is that? That's revised standard. Oh, okay, of course. Okay. Janet, what do you have? New International Version. Oh, okay, you, you want, want me to read it? Yeah, if you would. Okay. <clears throat> From the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Right. Yeah. Um the the wheel and woe uh poetry that uh, was in dona's revised standard is um pretty clear i think in the um, original uh and this is a god who says don't believe in the devil there is no such thing um 
this God who created the universe says, I create all good fortune, which means wheel, and I create all bad fortune, which means woe. Um, so uh, don't go apologizing for me. Uh, I, I take blame for everything. Um, this is a really big God. Um, and in some ways, I don't know, I find it refreshing. Not everybody would. Um, this isn't the God who takes credit for all the good things and blames all the bad things on the devil. In other mm -hmm. words, yeah. So, the, go ahead. I was just going to say, in the modern language version, it says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Calamity. Well, that really gets to it, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Of course, we like to let God off the hook by saying, you know, God didn't make bad things happen. They just happened because of the laws of the universe, right? The, right. God is right. not in control. What is it? Uh, oh, I've forgotten. I, there's an important quote from William Sloan Coffin that I've forgotten completely, but is totally germane in this regard. If I could remember it, it'd be good. Um, anyway. Yeah, it's yeah a, we truly uh, don't go ahead. read this passage <clears throat> today. I am the no. Lord, I create the disaster calamity. Right. It's, That's not it's something so, you preach. <laughs> <coughs> right. I, I, yeah. Uh, maybe I should. Uh, it, seems a little re it seems kind of refreshing to me. You know, it's sort of like, that that actually makes more sense to me that that is if 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 God Almighty it's the whole it's the whole shoot match right yeah I mean by apologizing for God maybe we're not doing God any service because if we believe God is big and created the whole thing and set the order up as it is why can't that God accept the responsibility for it when children get cancer, you know, right? Which is just uh, ultimately that. I mean, if we say it's the laws of nature and God created the laws of nature, I mean, there is responsibility there. It's yeah. not like he's pointing his finger and say, well, I think you are due a hurricane and right. here it comes down. I mean, right. Um, exactly. And that's one thing that this Isaiah does. He, do he doesn't really come around and say that the people have been, he, it, I, I doesn't seem to, to talk about this God as a thunderbolt thrower like Zeus, who has vengeance uh, at all. Um, things happen and they're bigger than we understand. What's that? No, yeah. that, that that would not be the vision that one would want to have. <laughs> no, that. no. I mean, but that ultimately, the creator of all the universe, ultimately, everything right. is responsible for everything. I right. And the Buddhists, Buddhists have a better time um, accepting this than I think most of us Christians. They... Um, are so concerned not to let circumstances rule our hearts that they're actually they actually have um, given us psychological ways of dealing with those things which are often very helpful that kind of goes to the this this idea of at least what i understand i've never read it in great detail but the jefferson bible thomas jefferson didn't he believe that God was the creator, but he did not intervene and wasn't a present. And exactly. that doesn't, for me personally, I kind of don't focus on the original creation as much as I do the loving presence. 
Right. So when I read something right. that says I am responsible for all the calamity, yeah. it just, it's jarring. Right. But if you focus on that original bigness of the creation, well then, okay, it fits. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find that William Sloan Coffin quote again, if I can. Can't seem to find it. Okay. My Google is not working. Well, that's really crazy. That. <laughs> <coughs> I wonder why. Oh, maybe it has something to do with me using Zoom right now. Oh, there it is. Hmm. God provides min God provides minimum protection and maximum support. <laughs> That's what he says. Hmm. Minimum protection and maximum support. Whoops, I think I lost something. Are y'all there? I think I lost you. You seem to be, you seem to be frozen. Oops, we lost them. Oops. I like your plants in your window. I can tell they all do very well. They get plenty of light, right? Oh, yeah, that's actually a plant stand. That it's okay. like a it's like a divider across the room. Yeah. Okay, it looked like it was in the window, but it, it looks like a perfect place to put plants. Yeah. Those are those are it's Ron's creation. <laughs> I, I, I got booted off. <laughs> Maybe it was because you were Such using Google at the same time as Zoom. <laughs> it was, I'm sure that's why, unless it's a, 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 a divine thing. <laughs> did, did you hear what I said about maximum, per, God offers minimum protection, but maximum support? You did? Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's not. So all of this, I was looking, I was trying to find the place I thought I, I had seen something in one of the earlier chapters about um, sort of relating to the, you know, human beings being as small as grasshoppers. I thought it said dust or something like that. Right. I was that that's all that would be consistent with that view. It is very, yeah. Yeah, that's in chapter 40. Okay. Yeah, yeah let me see where that was. Yeah, well, surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. Yeah, drop in the bucket. Okay. Isn't that terrific? Yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, the, let me pick it up right there because that's kind of worth talking about. Um, that was verse uh, 15 of chapter 40. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor is animals enough for burnt offerings. 
Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded to him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal work casts it. A metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They look for the skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Um, the second Isaiah just has a lot of fun with, uh, with idols, and he's thinking about this. Um, in his lifetime, he not only saw uh, the nation of Judah get carted off into Babylon, where he went as well. So he must have been among the elite in some regard. But he lived long enough to see uh, the Persians uh, defeat the Babylonians. And uh, there's this wonderful chapter. Uh, so yeah, chapter 46. So if you want to find chapter 46, it's kind of wonderful. Okay. Now we see he pictures Babylonian idols um, that are very heavy, you know, made of gold and silver and all, being carted off on the backs of uh, beasts by the Persians to be put in a museum somewhere. Um, and so the, the Persians can say, look at look there, those are the people we defeated. These, those are their gods. So it says, Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. Those are, those are the gods. Their idols are on beasts and cattle. These things you carry are loaded as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together. They cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. Hearken to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear, I will carry, and will save. To whom will you liken me and make me equal, and compare me that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales, hire a goldsmith, and he makes it into a god. Then they fall down and worship it. They lift it up upon their shoulders, they carry it, they set it in its place, and it stands there. It can't move from its place. If one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. Remember this and consider, recall it to your mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Well, he's definitely building him up. Yeah, he's building himself up. <laughs> or, the, or the prophet is building up this, this image of God. Yeah. yeah uh, I mean. While making making fun of any idol that you would um, that you would put on your mantelpiece um, made of wood, or that um, the king would fashion out of silver and gold. Mm -hmm. Both being worthless. Um, it reminded it reminded me of um, coming to Portland, which I did quite a number of times when I was pastor in Ashland. We'd bring the middle schoolers up for confirmation, <clears throat> and we take them to. Uh, I knew a woman who wrote icons. Um, and she was a Russian Orthodox, and we went to. Um, a wonderful American uh, Methodist Episcopal or African Methodist Episcopal Church in North Portland, which just had the most amazing worship I can imagine, uh, full of great music. And anyway, among those things, we go to uh, the temple downtown in Portland, the Jewish temple, and um, they would let us see their Torah scrolls. But more than that, they showed us this other Torah scroll that was kept uh, in a separate um, cabinet. I, they have a special name for it. I've forgotten what it is. And that Torah scroll had been uh, liberated 
from some Nazi storehouse where it had been kept. It had been taken from, uh, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, a temple, a Jewish synagogue in Prague and had been kept by the Nazis in, in perfect order. Uh, they didn't burn it or anything, but they had plans to put it in a museum for an extinct race. Mm. Once they had defeated everything. So I, I <laughs> it's not quite the same idea as Bell and Nebo. Um, of course not. That but, comes what's that? How did his find? How did that Torah come to be in Portland? I I forgot how it came to be in Portland. It, it seems strange, doesn't it? Maybe, maybe well, a rabbi. I, I'm sure it was probably some rabbi knew somebody when they said, "Where should we? Where should we take this? You know, where should we put it?" Yeah. I, it always moved me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I really don't have anything else of, of note uh, to share from this at this moment, at least. I have a bit, I mean, perhaps off topic, but, um, you know, the creating an idol and then worshiping that and thinking that has power and such, that's one thing. But when you go through any church in Europe or anywhere, really, the churches are filled with with art that we consider to be valuable and beautiful and revered. At what point is it idolatrous to have all of that? Yeah, what, what do you think? I don't know, it seems to me a fine line. I mean, if, if you truly just say it's the, this art that was being carted off on these animals was were images that were worshipped as intrinsic having value in and of itself. That's one thing. But if it was representational art in some way, I think we're all still guilty of that. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's really fascinating. I, I don't... Yeah, go ahead. You know, um, I mean, well, in the that, you know, if you'd be murdered if you create images of Muhammad, isn't it that you can't? Right, exactly. You know, you well said. That's that's a really good, created. very good example. The Catholic Church throughout its history has had um, concerns about this. Um, Francis, you know, uh, Saint Francis in what the 1100s, 1200s, uh, went to Rome and uh, was greeted by actually a friendly Pope who took it well when Francis said that um, the church had too much gold and silver and art at that point, that it was worshiping that. And the, and the Pope actually agreed with them that they'd lost some of the spirit of the poverty of Jesus. Um, in, 1962, I guess, during Vatican II, um, the Vatican II Council, you know, which was quite liberal under Pope John the XXIII, uh, not only got rid of the Latin Mass, but told churches to purge, to purge their churches of, of images uh, and to keep only, you know, the, the key ones like Mary, uh, they didn't want everything. Um, I was, you know, pastor in 1980 uh, over in the Cully neighborhood. I mentioned that in the sermon on Sunday and was friends with uh, a priest at um, um, St. Rose of Lima Catholic Church, which is at 60th and Sandy Boulevard. And the uh, priest was wonderful, very post-Vatican II, very liberal priest. And he had learned from the priest who'd been there before, who was Father Zenner, who was something of a saint. Um, and Father Zenner had been there during the Vatican II purge and had been more than happy to get rid of statues and things that he thought were just gaudy and awful. However, 
he had trouble when it came to convincing anybody that they should let go of the statue of St. Rose of Lima they had, which was actually in the center of their worship space, the transept where the cross is made. Uh, he didn't like her because she was clearly an, um, you know, a white girl from Cleveland or something that the, the mm -hmm. model for her, she was not um, definitely not Peruvian. So he had someone or someone, uh, someone painted uh, a Peruvian woman, a, a really nice painting that they introduced to the space, but um, nobody wanted to get rid of St. Rose. And so what he did was every Sunday for a whole year, he moved that, um, that statue, which was uh, sitting freely uh, a few inches toward the, the sacristy every Sunday so that the once a week worshipers might not notice <laughs> and the once a day worshipers wouldn't notice at all. And pretty soon she was right at the edge and then he just got rid of her and he succeeded in, in having her uh, leave the church, <laughs> which was, uh, I think second Isaiah might, not, might appreciate. <laughs> That's an amazing story. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I learned it early in my ministry. You know, if you do things small or, or slowly, maybe you can get away with stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. But your point about, you know, the, the Muslims and no images of Muhammad is uh, take that very seriously. Uh, that's obviously carried the day. Um, and, you know, if you talk to and you probably have, you know, Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox people about their about their icons. You know, they will they will tell you uh, that those are not I, those are not idols by any means. They are windows through which one can see God if one is uh, prayerful about that. That you can you aren't looking at the icon; you're actually looking through the icon. To something beyond it and I, I would be in favor of getting rid of religious art i think it plays a very important role in inspiration understanding i, I wouldn't be in favor of it but i do think it's a it's a tricky topic um it is janet i've always want i want always i haven't known you always but since we met and i heard you'd lived in mexico city I wanted to ask you what you thought of um, Our Lady of Guadalupe and the, the image there in, in the cathedral in Mexico City of her that is like revered among above anything I know of, right? It's like it is, the most holy piece of art I can imagine outside of maybe the Shroud of Turin, but it, it's actually probably more, more reverable. What, what do you think of it? Well, I personally, it's not my faith, so it's not something that has huge meaning for me in terms of the authenticity of it. But I think what it represents for Mexico and for the, the more peasant Indian class of Mexico is extremely important and they're very um, older in great high regard. Um, look to her. The female images, I mean, they're sort of the Spanish class will look to Mary and the more Indian uh, indigenous class will look to the Virgin of Guadalupe, but they play very similar roles in the Catholic faith in Mexico. Are they and not the people same? Go on... No, the Virgin Mary is the mother of Jesus and the Guadalupe is the woman who appeared to the peasant in Mexico and uh, became a saint. She's, she's I thought considered it was... a saint. I thought she was considered. Uh, I thought she was considered Mary <clears throat> to be Mary. I think. I, no, they're separate. I mean, the okay. Virgin, I, the Virgin, I, you know, I believe the Virgin you. Of Guadalupe, separate images, separate everything, and the Virgin of Guadalupe is very Mexican. Yeah. She doesn't, you know, doesn't have a universal presence, okay. but they play a similar role. Yeah. And it's kind of cultural which one you might revere more in your home. 
Mm -hmm. um, but she's very, very important and symbolically she's important. I think anything that can help people come together in community and faith for me is a positive thing. Right. I don't think people worship that shroud as much as they do when they're in that Basilica of Guadalupe, which is built on the hill where the apparition actually happened or supposedly happened. There's a feeling of the presence of of God and saintliness and mm -hmm. holiness. So that there's a feeling there more than that people think. Mm -hmm. And it's a fine line. It's a fine line. Yeah. But people are very devout. They feel she provides protection. They wouldn't go along with that minimum protection, maximum support. No. <laughs> people Not at all. Is there right. and ask for miracles. They really believe that the Virgin wow. La Virgen will will intervene, intervene and provide protection yeah. Yeah. i'm not going to take there, that away from yeah i wouldn't take that away from anybody they'll go and they in fact i've been there many many times in fact uh, i've made pilgrimages there just to feel what it feels like i walk like from my home there which maybe is 10 miles mm -hmm. and that's that's quite a high yeah but it's just to feel what feels like as you approach the basilica and people are on their knees and walking that long long distances people will put on rugs and they'll walk in another rug and they come to give thanks for the miracles and they'll bring those little things called milagros yes you've probably seen those oh yeah charms. and you you pin that to a robe somewhere in the basilica to give thanks for healing your liver or your limb or yeah. the, there's milagros for every conceivable favor you might have asked and give thanks right. by pinning it on the ropes there i've only That's seen those culture, but i've only seen those in new mexico but i got the feeling from the people yeah, at, they're, they're all over new yeah they yeah it's very cultural but you know it's not my personal belief but i have great respect for the power of uh of the Virgin of Guadalupe, and I don't think there's anything bad in it. In that people have devout belief and support, and yeah, I can think of a lot of worse things. Of course, yes. And the you know the actual shroud or whatever the word is for that image. I personally kind of don't believe in that kind of magic, but. It's there and people revere it. So mm -hmm. who might it say? When I go out to the Trappist Abbey of Our Lady of Guadalupe in uh, in Carlton, um, I'm the the faith of the Trappist Trappist monks there in regard to that image is palpable. Um, I feel it even from them, and they're all a bunch of white guys. Well, they aren't all, mm -hmm. but most of them are, yeah. yeah. If you're ever in Mexico City, I think it's kind of a must place to go. Yeah, I and would in have December, when it's her, you know, December 12th is her Saint's Day. You know, people from all over the country pile into the back of pickup trucks and they march and they show their devotion and it's a huge deal. Yeah. Well, folks, I think we've we've reached a, a fullness here. So I think this has been marvelous. Well, I appreciate you. Oh, yeah, it's been great. Where two or three are gathered. Well, so. Yeah. Where two well, thank you for gathered. thank you for the thank you for the lessons. You bet. This has been great. Right. All right. We'll catch up. We'll do it next yeah. week. We'll see who shows up for Jeremiah. OK. All righty. Thank you all. I hope you feel better. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Don't get COVID, don't I?